Hello everyone, this is Gregory Brennan with Virginia Clean Cities and you're watching the Technology Happy Hour. And before we get to our featured stakeholder today, I wanted to mention and ask if anyone else is interested in becoming a stakeholder of Virginia Clean Cities, or if you're interested in being featured in a future Tech Happy Hour, please follow the link below this video to our website where you can find out more information about being a stakeholder and what Virginia Clean Cities does. For today's Tech Happy Hour, we're featuring Nathan Bowen, the co-founder and president of DC America. And for those of you that don't know what DC America does, they create a modular sort of turnkey charging system for EVs. And let me take a quick moment to introduce Mr. Bowen. At present, Mr. Bowen is driving DC America's growth in its vision for minimally invasive electric vehicle supply system, also known as EVSE infrastructures. So while DC America is relatively new to the market, only being founded in 2022, Mr. Bowen is not. With well over a decade of extensive experience in energy management and infrastructures and electrical infrastructures, Mr. Bowen previously served as a partner at Dixon Electrical Systems, a comprehensive electrical contractor based in West Virginia. He is also a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBEW, and a certified electrical vehicle infrastructure training program, EVITP, trainer for the IBEW. While that is a mouthful, it is representative of Mr. Bowen's experience and expertise in the energy sector. So with that, I'll pass it over to Mr. Bowen and let him introduce himself. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I appreciate the VCC team and uh, hosting this and you know, giving us the opportunity here. Uh, so here we go. So like I said, I, I'm Nathan Bowen. I'm, I'm from West Virginia and I'm born and raised in the state of West Virginia. Um, I actually live in Barbersville, West Virginia, but our facility is in Milton, West Virginia. Um, you know, what we do is uh, DC America designs, manufactures, and commissions uh, and ships turnkey single point connection charging depots. So, you know, you can kind of see in the, the um, slides here, you know, we basically, and I'll show you all of our uh, competencies here in a few minutes, but engineer, manufacturer. So we're manufacturing the whole, uh, let me get my pointer here. The whole structural raceway, uh, it's a patent pending system, uh, all the wiring comes. And then basically we ship the whole station charging beat depot on a truck uh, to its end destination where uh, a simple single point connection and you're up and charging. Um, give you a little bit of history behind DC America. Uh, we were formed actually by two different companies, the ownership groups of two different companies. Uh, Dixon Electrical Systems, which uh, Greg mentioned earlier, I'm still part of the ownership group of that. Another company called Synergy, uh, which basically worked in the natural gas and energy industries. Um, so basically, we came together to form DC America uh, in an attempt to, you know, basically kind of head more towards the clean energy fields. Um, we had all the infrastructure available already via Synergy and the labor, you know, electrically via Dixon to design, you know, we had a whole engineering staff on board. Um, we have the ability to, um, you know, multiple welders, welding facilities here on our facility um, to weld the structures, paint and blast. So we had all the infrastructure basically to set this up, uh, you know, to basically help electrify quicker. Um, you know, some of the um, certifications, you know, our group has is NACE. Uh, so that's basically a coding certification for the painting of our structures. EPRI is an electrical uh, certification. ASME is more of a welding. Uh, we are EVITP certified and we do have an in-house UL 508A industrial control uh, panel shop. So we're able to build our own uh, panel boards. Um, you know, core competencies, um, you know, really what we go to market with is consulting. Uh, you know, we're looking at our customers charging requirements. Uh, electrical feed studies, um, you know, when you get into the safety side of this, uh, arc flash analysis, uh, you're, you're starting to talk some high amperage systems here and utility coordination. Our engineering group, um, you know, basically we engineer every one of the stations we build. So it's not only a structural uh, engineering uh, background, but also electrical. Um, you know, typically when we engineer our stations, we're able to give our customers a complete set of one line drawings, uh, bill of material, you know, basically all the studies that go into wind loads, um, you know, 
snow loads, that kind of stuff, whatever's uh, required by the AHJ in that particular uh, area. We do manufacture all of our uh, stations here in-house. So we are basically manufacturing pre-wired, pre-commissioned. You know, I think that's very important too. You know, I, I've been in this field for a while now and you know, it seems like one of the big pitfalls is the disconnect between charger hardware, charger software. Uh, I really feel like that's a, um, you know, a very valuable uh, asset to have to be able to commission these before we leave uh, our facility. Uh, so we're actually powering these stations up, charging vehicles before they leave. Um, mobile EV charging solutions, we engineered that. Uh, you know, microgrid, uh, battery storage systems. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're also able to do electrical gear startup and commissioning uh, prior to uh, departure from our facility. Um, yeah, our installation side, service side, so we, we can do on-site uh, system installation. Uh, we have electrical contracting licenses, uh, general contracting licenses across the United States. Um, we are EVITP trained, and I'll, I'll kind of go into this a little bit later, but um, you'll see with a lot of the government subsidized uh, programs, uh, it will require EVITP certified electricians not only to install, but to maintain uh, the systems. Um, you know, one thing we like to tell our customer base too is, we highly encourage coordinating with local contractors. We love to work with local electrical contractors. Um, you know, typically we find that they've got rela great relationships with the local utility companies. Uh, we have relationships with local utility companies, but sometimes the, the local uh, touch kind of helps as well. Um, you know, who, who do we actually sell to? Our clients, um, you know, we've mostly uh, been working in the fleet space behind the fence space. Um, you know, Nevi rollout's been kind of slow. So, um, you know, we are working on some commercial projects as well, but, you know, majority of our work to date has been, um, you know, to help out the fleets, the bus clients, the, you know, public transportation, trucks, uh, you know, trucks as a service clients, charging as a service clients, uh, transportation operators. Uh, we're doing quite a bit uh, for the drayage trucks, uh, electrification delivery fleets, um, vehicle manufacturers. Uh, when, when it comes to charge point operators, uh, we're working on, and I'll show you a slide that kind of shows you some of our solutions here in a little bit, but standardized NEVI solutions to where basically the whole NEVI setup is completely pre-wired, pre-built, pre-commissioned, and it arrives uh, ready just for the single point connection to the utility transformer. Um, you know, distributed DC packaging. We get a lot of our, uh, you know, charge point operators when they get into distributed DC systems. Um, I think you all are mentioning potentially like EVgo, you know, some of those clients. Um, a lot of those are utilizing the split rectifier and dispenser setup. So, uh, you know, being able to package those to make those a lot easier for on-site installation. Uh, charger manufacturers, you know, we're working with, um, excuse me, several charger manufacturers to basically package their solutions together, uh, make it easier to sell to their clientele. Um, you know, mobile solutions, uh, you know, lots of different stuff for charger manufacturers themselves. And then private business and government, um, you know, we, we see a lot of need for redeployable solutions or minimally invasive, invasive um, uh, solutions for lease spaces. Some of our clients may only be leasing their property for two to five years. So they're wanting something where they do not lose their uh, underground infrastructure investment. Um, we, we also do level two, um, you know, rapidly deployed level two solutions in combination with DC fast charging. So, you know, kind of what, and I'll show you some pictures that kind of explain how our systems work here in a few minutes, but what is included in our system um, you know, the switch gear circuit protection, that is all built into it. All the wiring to the chargers and dispensers. Um, in a lot of cases, there's communications and controls, uh, you know, tip protection, you know, that kind of stuff for uh, different charger manufacturers. Rectifier and power supply installation and wiring. Uh, again, the testing commissioning, I think that's a big part of this. Um, you know, one thing too, I think is the cost savings that uh, sometimes people don't realize of what we do we offer a complete engineered package. So you get a set of drawings with this. So, 
when, when folks are engineering their sites, um, you know, probably the larger majority of the electrical engineering package, uh, we're taking care of that because you know, all the one lines, details, that kind of stuff that go along uh, with the installation is you know, part of our package. And I'll add to, um, we are charger hardware agnostic. So we work with um, you know, all the manufacturers out there. Um, pretty much we'll put anybody's charger on our, um, our platforms. We have preferences, but uh, we are willing to work with others. But you can kind of see some of the pictures over here of the different you know, aspects of installation and what we're doing uh, in that market. So the, the structural raceway, and this is really the key of what we do. So it's an above ground um, system. So you can kind of see a before and after uh, system here. This is for a, um, you know, basically a, a behind the fence dredge truck application. Uh, in this application, it had three 180 kilowatt. Um, there are Heliox Flex 180s is what it is, but um, uh, basically a total of nine dispensers, a 2000 amp panel board, but you can see all the cabling is encapsulated inside of our structural raceway system. So everything is pre-wired. Uh, we actually pre-commissioned this system prior to its departure, um, which in this case required uh, you know, multiple vehicles because this system is a dynamic charging system. So you have to have uh, a minimum of three vehicles to check out each system to make sure all the, the software uh, side of this is working. Um, you know, one thing uh, I like to typically show clients is our, you know, on-site uh, versus uh, stick built, you know, comparisons here. So the DC America system, as opposed to the traditional way of stick building, um, you know, typical underground conduit, pulling wire, pouring pads. Uh, you know, in this particular application, um, we have a design which we're building right now, a 57 foot structure, which we're able to ship on one truck. So it had three rectifiers, six dispensers, and a 1600 amp gear. So we were able to prevent 120 electrical connections in the field, uh, 1200 feet of cable being pulled, 57 foot of trench, 36 conduit runs. Um, you know, my background in contracting, uh, you know, especially when you head into winter, uh, and depending on where you're at, your locale, you know, weather delays become a huge factor uh, in outside construction. Uh, you know, there's safety issues with having open trenches, uh, you know, a lot of issues, uh, you know, with looking at the traditional stick built way of doing things, which we're able to eliminate a lot of these by uh, putting it in a conditioned environment and uh, building it where we never have weather delays. Uh, I, I threw this in here. I, I kind of ran into this in the past week, but uh, basically this is kind of some studies on, you know, the benefits of prefab modular construction. Um, it, this has been used for decades. Um, you know, a lot of the energy industry uses it, natural gas energy, uh, natural gas industry uses it, um, uh, data centers, you know, pretty much all of these, uh, uh, um, uh, they, they use the prefab solution. So what, what I found kind of interesting is, you know, people that actually use it, they were very positive towards these particular um, you know, increased schedule certainty, um, reduced waste, which I think that's huge. You know, we're able to recycle uh, a lot of the scrap materials here. Whereas if you're on site on a construction job, typically there's only one, um, you know, roll off dumpster, you know, if anything and everything is getting dumped into that. So we're able to, you know, split this stuff up, copper, steel, you know, be able to recycle this stuff. Uh, another big one in our industry is safety. You know, it's a safer environment in the uh, controlled environment of a uh, manufactured workspace. Um, and I'll touch into this a little bit later too, but looking at this as a contractor, you know, workforce shortages. Um, I can tell you uh, from my own experience, it's very difficult to find uh, folks that want to jump into the skilled trades. Um, so anything we can do to basically make ourselves more efficient in the field um, that's what we do. Uh, we we pre-manufacture stuff for commercial buildings. Um, my electrical contracting uh, company does, but pretty much every large contractor now is heading towards pre-manufactured uh, and modular construction. So what are we doing to advance uh, clean transportation? And this is kind of not really case studies, but just kind of giving you some ideas of some of the different products. Um, 
you know, we use um, out in the field currently, um, you know, kind of catering to the pilot programs. Uh, we see this with um, last mile delivery services, food delivery services, uh, buses, uh, public transportation. You're seeing a lot of folks across the United States in these big fleets. They're just kind of testing the waters right now, just seeing what works what kind of charging equipment they want to use, what trucks work, what software works. So, you know, one of the things we came up with early on was uh, basically an all-in-one charger on a platform that basically had an extension cord. Uh, so, you know, the folks that are, uh, you know, running pilot programs, as they move their fleet around to try it in different locales, they're able to take the charging with them. Um, this location's in California. Uh, the location here on the right is actually at the uh, Thomas School Bus Facility in High Point, North Carolina. So they were kind of needing some uh, additional assistance with their existing charging. So rapidly deployed, uh, you can kind of see the fork pockets in these units. So it's a protective cage. You're able to fork truck these quickly, uh, disconnect them and reconnect them. If, if you look at the picture in the center here, and this sometimes helps us get make it a little easier permitting is the, the uh, end user, the customer roughed in um, basically electrical receptacles for 480 volts. So they could just come in, plug it, unplug it as needed, but uh, kind of helps the permitting process when you're trying to rapidly deploy a, uh, you know, excuse me, a fleet or a pilot program. One thing that we have noticed, uh, especially with EPA Clean Bus um, Grant Program, uh, we, we've seen a lot of issues where folks, you know, counties, transportation directors, they may only be getting one or two buses from this EPA Clean Bus Program. So that program basically provides pretty much the entire funding uh, to provide electric bus, uh, granted that they give up one of their diesel uh, buses. So what we found is, is a lot of our customer base, especially in rural areas, they have 208 volts available. They do not have 480 volts available. And it's either an issue getting 480 volts to that location or uh, time is of the essence or uh, maybe they don't have the budget for it. So we've developed some solutions that have step up transformers and it's all in a nice tidy package that they can move around. Um, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, transportation directors don't necessarily know where they want to put their charging at yet. So they like the capability of being able to move these, uh, see where it fits their operation. So basically this system has a, a transformer, step up transformer, a DC fast charger. This particular configuration is a 40 kW. Uh, so it, it can charge two vehicles at 20 kW or one vehicle at 40. There are limitations, you know, to uh, stepping up power like that. Um, you know, with 208 volts, you're gonna have a lot higher amperage. So we can't just go putting a whole Nevi station on 208 volts. That would be very um, difficult, you know, grid wise. Uh, that's why we have to go to 480, but it is definitely a, a nice solution for folks that kind of just want to dip their toes in the water uh, and don't really want to put the entire investment in 480 volt yet. Uh, just gives them a nice entry level uh, system. Uh, mobile options, rapid deployment. Uh, you know, we see this, some interest in hurricane states, um, events, um, you know, rental fleets, that kind of stuff. But basically, we designed this module towards, um, you know, being able to easily, you could either set it on the ground, you could set it on a trailer, or you could set it on the back of the truck. Uh, the same unit could do all three. It's just a matter of mounting it to the, uh, you know, particular transportation. Uh, we have quick connections. Uh, for you know, whatever power source, whether it's utility power source. Um, you know, I was at a show, actually the Virginia Clean City show here, I think it was last week or the week before, uh, a company from California called Moxian uh, is developing some of really cool uh, stuff in battery energy storage and uh, pull behind. So basically a 600 kilowatt system that's about the size of a typical generator, um, but really gives a lot of neat options for um, you know, off-grid or micro-grid or, you know, those kind of applications where you need some um, energy quick. Uh, temporary permanent medium voltage power distribution. That's a lot of words. Um, 
we're seeing a need for this and like rapidly deploying uh, more of industrial fleets. Uh, sometimes we find in uh, whether it be army bases or uh, you know behind defense fleets, they have availability to uh, medium voltage, which is 1,000 to 35,000 volts. So we have the means to procure in, in a lot of cases, and uh, we're using reconditioned transformers just based on lead times. But basically, we're building them systems where they can quickly deploy this, um, and they, they're able to use these quick connections and just get them by for a temporary and even permanent solutions at times. But uh, it alleviates waiting on the utility company sometimes. Um, uh, but, you know, you have to have primary voltage. We, we, we see in some instances as well, um, you know, let's just say, for instance, in heavy stations, there will be some instances where it makes sense to purchase primary power from the power company, which means that you would take that, you know, 13,000 volt or whatever install transformer that you would own uh, and really kind of speeds up the process as well as, you know, there's some, uh, monetary advantages as well. So the demand rates are lower. Uh, and this isn't everywhere in the country, but in certain applications is very doable. Um, you know, PV and battery energy storage uh, integrations. And this kind of shows a concept we came up with here a while back. But uh, in this case, it was 100 kilowatt battery energy storage with PV roofs, um, you know, multiple DC fast chargers. So definitely able to, uh, excuse me, integrate battery energy storage and PV. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot, especially in fleets, um, you know, they're, they're really looking into microgrids. Uh, what can you do for that? Um, you know, we can integrate lighting systems into our platforms. Again, it's just using the, the structural raceways. And, you know, I don't think I really pointed out this out earlier, but all of our raceways have an opening in the end. So there's compatibility with our typical DC America structural raceway so we can extend on down the line without future digging. So it's just a matter of setting more and more modules down the line and utilizing the structural raceway. Um, this is something that kind of came out of more of the bus market. Um, you know, folks that were behind the fence, um, you know, we had a clientele that did not want to do any digging. So what you would typically see on the side of a building, an overhead electrical service, uh, we basically built a module that completely pre-built, pre-wired with the current transformer, CT cabinet metering, uh, electrical gear, and then the ability to use our structural raceway. Uh, but it arrives, you know, you basically bolt it down to the ground. It could be placed on gravel. Uh, there's multiple different uh, mounting options, but basically the electrical feed would be overhead so there'd be no digging. So, um, you know, in some instances, we're finding uh, clients that you know, have a lot of environmental issues under the earth. So uh, lots and lots of permitting uh, hoops to jump through to try to make that happen, to be able to dig. So it's kind of gives those folks another option to, uh, you know, no excavation. Uh, you know, one, one of the big, um, you know, I think advantages that we can kind of bring to the table as well is our UL 508A, uh, custom power distribution panels. So, you know, a lot of cases we're seeing that the typical lead time for switch gear these days is upwards of 50 to 60 weeks. Um, you know, we can dramatically reduce that by building those in-house. Uh, again, we're UL 508A listed. We can list our own panels. Uh, we're self-certifying. So uh, we basically can build the switch gear custom to whatever configuration we want. Uh, and we're able to purchase these uh, you know, overcurrent protection. Um, I mean, it's, in some of these cases, you know, less than four weeks, you know, we're able to build these panels. Um, just depends on the configuration. Pre-wired, pre-commissioned NEVI compliance stations. Um, NEVI, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure. I think uh, Rick was talking about this earlier, but, um, you know, basically a public facing system with all the components required for uh, to meet NEVI compliance. You know, this particular situation, these are 150 kilowatt DC fast chargers, but, you know, we're looking at them with 350s, 360s, uh, different configurations, but the same principle of having the uh, single point connection electrical gear on board. So it's just the one 
set of conduits coming in, make a single point connection. This all arrives pre-commissioned. So typically when we roll onto the site, you know, we're having a station up uh, in, a, in a made ready site in less than typically a day. Uh, and we're, you know, test charging on, on site. Uh, we do have ADA compliant uh, offerings on that as well. Uh, again, minimal site disturbance. Um, and this is, you know, I, I think this is one of the key points too I want to kind of get across to is, um, you know, what are we doing to kind of advance clean transportation? Uh, education, you know, it's not only for the workforce, but I think, you know, our clientele, but um, an EVITP certified workforce. So again, when you, when you start looking at the NEVI, when you look at the clean heavy duty program, the ports grant, uh, climate environmental justice block grants, uh, the EPA clean bus, um, pretty much anything that is under title 23 is required to have EVITP certified electricians um, as well as uh, four year apprenticeship train. So those are both things that we are doing uh, in our EVIT, excuse me, in our IBEW uh, apprenticeship program here locally, we actually train each of our fourth year apprentices to the EVITP standard. They are certified prior to becoming a journeyman. Um, here on staff at DC America, I'm one of them, but I've got four other guys that are um, EVITP certified instructors. So we're able to quickly you know, increase our numbers as needed. Um, I believe I got this off of the um, EVITP website, but you know, currently in the United States, there are seven, 700,000 registered electricians, and currently 20,000 have been certified through EVITP. So that's 2.9% of that total uh, you know, population of electricians. And I'll say that probably a lot of those electricians, um, you know, they they may never work on electric vehicle infrastructure. So there's a definite need for uh, qualified certified electricians in this field. Um, you know, I think that's one thing we're trying to do is kind of uh, circle the wagons and, you know, provide a, a product that is, uh, you know, meets these requirements. It meets all the, the federal standards for EBITP certification, four-year apprenticeship training. Um, you know, you know, you're getting a quality product, uh, you know, it's commissioned, our service folks, you know, they're able to work on this or EVITP trained. Um, I think it's very critical for uh, you know, advancing clean transportation. So that's that's my presentation. I guess I'll open it up, Greg, to questions at this point. Yeah, of course. Um, everyone, you can feel free to write your question in the chat or you can unmute. Uh, preferably you raise your hand so not everyone's unmuted at once and uh, I'll call on you. Uh, but again, you could write them in the chat if you'd like. Um, totally up to you guys. Uh, I'll, I have one question for you. Some people may know, um, so some people may not. But when you say NEVI compliant, um, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so, you know, in order to, and this is changing over time, you know, there was some of the Buy America standards that were waived uh, until 2024, but uh, NEVI compliant would have a, con, you know, basically a, a component of have an ADA, uh, you know, that has to be designed in American Disabilities Act. The chargers themselves need to be Buy America compliant. Um, you know, the steel we use is all American made steel. We're using EVITP certified labor. Um, and four-year apprenticeship training. So basically every box that you have to check off to build infrastructure for NEVI, uh, that's what we're doing. Great. Um, David uh, Gellman, I'm going to feel free to unmute yourself yep. and ask your question. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, uh, Nathan, this is a great solution, I think, for a lot of folks. Um, like any prefab solution, obviously the units cost a little bit more, but you're saving on the installation. Do you have a feel for overall how much somebody can save on an installation? Just go with like, say a single uh, DC fast charger, somewhere around the 40, 60 kilowatt size. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, looking at it as a station, there's definitely cost savings. Um, it, it's more exaggerated in um, what I would call distributed DC systems or remote rectifiers and dispensers because there's just a lot more conduit cabling controls going on. 
Um, you know, every time we look at a new design, we're basically comparing it against stick belt. You know, that's, I guess that's one of the advantages we have of owning an electrical contracting company as well. Uh, we run the numbers to stick build it versus construct it. I think, you know, one of the advantages too to what we're doing here is uh, the capability to expand uh, for probably a fraction of the cost of what it would cost to, uh, you know, typically stick build this and expand it. Um, one other, I think, advantage to the, the prefabrication as well is you know, having this wide open platform. I think you'll see a lot of people going with all in one chargers for the first few go arounds. Maybe not, but um, you know, like the Terra 184, ADB, or you know, different uh, manufacturers. The flexibility of this platform gives you, um, you know, you basically have an open raceway. So you could switch to distributed DC systems like Tesla, you know, folks like that in the future without having to re-rough in everything. But I mean, as far as the cost, it, it just depends on the location. It depends on the chargers. Um, you know, we are definitely seeing cost savings. Um, you know, is it 10, 20%, you know, potentially in some cases it might be equal, but I think the advantages that you're gaining uh, far outweigh stick building. Okay. Thanks, Nathan. Yes, sir. Thank you, David. Uh, Steve, your question. A couple of uh, a couple questions. Uh, first, how much work are you doing in um, multi-unit uh, dwellings for residential? And then the second one is talk a little bit about the lifespan of the above ground compared to an in-ground um, and whether or not is it kind of somewhat of a temporary solution or do you keep it out there for years on occasion? Yeah, you know, for multi-unit dwellings, I really didn't show that in this slideshow. Um, I and mean, we have some solutions for level two stuff that, you know, eliminate digging. Uh, basically, it's the same steel structure with level two stuff on it. Um, you know, really what we found is, you know, it, it's, we really don't have as much cost advantage when it comes down to that kind of stuff, the level two smaller unless the client is thinking of future expansion and potentially going to DC fast charging. So at that point, we give them a platform uh, that they can grow into. Uh, it definitely makes sense for that, but it's just very difficult for us to compete with a single one inch conduit going to a charger. Um, you know, it's, it's just a lot easier to make that uh, make sense with, um, you know, DC fast charging. As far as longevity, um, I encourage you to go, it's, I think it's on our YouTube channel, but, you know, we, we showed our structure and you know, a lot of this is quarter and three eighths inch steel. You can literally run construction equipment over top of this. Um, I mean, we've got a video of us doing that and showing, um, you know, lighter gauge, typical wireway kind of stuff getting crushed. I mean, we've taken, uh, you know, anvils, we've taken torches, you know, done all this stuff. It's kind of a funny video. I encourage you to watch it. But, uh, you know, the coating systems on this, some of them are galvanized, some are painted. You know, typically, a galvanized system is guaranteed for 40 years underground. Uh, some of our painting systems are 20 years plus. The steel will outlast probably any of us on this call. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. We had a question come in from the chat. Um, Andy asked, uh, how are we buy America, says how are buy America policies and supply chains issues respective to the transformer metals and such affecting your work? Uh, you know, I, you know, really, if you read the NEVI guidance, really all they talk about in NEVI is the charger itself is buy America compliance. Um, you know, I think charger manufacturers are, you know, most charger manufacturers, there's probably at least five or six that are uh, opening plants in the United States or have open plants in the United States. They will have compliant um, chargers probably in the fourth quarter, if not first quarter. Um, you know, some are, have some right now. Um, you know, I, I can't really say as far as transformers goes because I really haven't seen, uh, you know, I, I have not seen you know, basically the, I shouldn't say the need, but your Nevi's not really requiring it. So 
uh, on the transfer. And a lot of times the transformers are provided by the utility company. So, you know, we're not really even handling that sometimes. Sometimes we are. Um, there are some domestic transformer manufacturers, but it's very difficult to source all the content as with anything. I think everybody's going to find that, you know, when you start getting above 55% content, it gets difficult uh, for a lot of manufacturers. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Um, I have another question, unless someone else has someone right off the bat. Bruce, go ahead. First, Nathan, I just want to compliment you on one of the most informative presentations we've had on here. Uh, your electrician background is very evident. You really know your stuff, and uh, not all charging company CEOs know it as well as you do. So that's that's pretty impressive. Um, real basic question here. You know, we deal with host sites from time to time, and you do too. What kind of education do you have to give them about EV charging in general and your product? And uh, what's some common questions you usually get from host sites? Yeah, I mean, it just depends on what, you know, how hands off they want to be versus how involved they want to be. Um, you know, sometimes it's software training. Um, just, you know, if we're white labeling something for somebody and, you know, they, they want the training on the software. Uh, I think general maintenance, um, you know, sometimes they want to handle that. Sometimes they want us to handle it. Um, you know, general maintenance on a typical DC fast charger, um, you know, on the air cooled units, it will require filter maintenance. Um, you know, obviously cord maintenance, um, you know, those kind of things. That's probably something that the site host wouldn't want to deal with. Um, you know, I guess just the general uh, ins and outs of questions they're going to get from their clientele. You know, those are things we have to kind of handle as well. I, you know, I think, Bruce, as, as the market heads towards more of the uh, ISO 15118, which is plug and charge, I think a lot of the issues will kind of wane away. Um, you know, basically, you're just plugging the charger in and walking away. Uh, you know, EV goes made a lot of good strides towards that. Um, in some cases, you know, you just plug, you set up your VIN number to a credit card. Uh, I think that's going to eliminate a lot of the uh, you know, questions out there um, rather than going to your app or scanning a QR code or trying to swipe a credit card, you know, those kind of things. Frederick or Rick, your question. Yeah, uh, quickly. Uh, you covered part of it, but the big talk all around the charging world now is the unreliability of stations when you get to them. So I have two questions. Number one, do you think your construction, to, are, are some of those in other places, they were doomed to fail from the beginning because of poor design? And have you tried to eliminate some of that? Do you think your construction method will make those maintenance needs lower and then ultimately what if they do want you to do it what is your response time i mean are you going to have uh repair people in all the states where you have one are you going to have to fly there from milton or how, how are you going to handle maintenance when they do want you to do it yeah i, mean, I think you know locally rick um you know we, we handle it in house um we have several partnerships across the country. You know, I've, I've got some equipment out in California. I've got a great company out there that, you know, I utilize that's certified and multiple manufacturers um, do great work. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a all hands on deck approach of making great partnerships. You know, one thing I've done, uh, you know, in developing this product, um, you know, we, we have visited every manufacturer that we consider using on our systems of charging hardware. Uh, and software as well. Um, you know, when you talk to some of the manufacturers, um, you know, some of the questions I ask is what, what's the parts availability currently? Um, you know, how quickly could I get one of your factory folks here? Do you offer factory training? I mean, we try to factory train our guys on every manufacturer that'll let us do it. Um, you know, I want to be able to maintain my own equipment. Um, you know, some, I think some of the companies probably, have less of a handle on parts availability. It's more about, you know, basically pushing all the parts towards manufacturing just to trying to meet the demand. Um, you know, th those are probably the companies, and I guess I'm answering this on strategies that I would use and what I would deploy. Uh, I'm gonna pick charger manufacturers that 
I feel the most comfortable with having parts availability. Um, you know, my plan would be to maintain parts myself, keeping parts myself, because that seems to be a lot of issues out there is, uh, you know, breaks and you're waiting three to eight weeks. I mean, I were waited upwards of 12 weeks one time for a cord, uh, a 200 amp cord, uh, CCS cable. So, um, you know, there's definitely issues uh, with that. You know, as far as our system, Rick, I mean, I think it's, um, I think the, the key to this is uh, having trained local people and partnerships. You know, I, I just don't think it makes sense for me to fly to California, nor does it make sense for people from California to fly to Virginia or West Virginia to maintain. So I think the key is we need to educate, uh, bring up people that can, you know, work on this. And that, I mean, that's why I kind of, I'm kind of concentrating on that. I feel like that's probably the most important piece of that is education and just, you know, having the parts availability. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it's not the charger hardware. It's a lot of software issues. Uh, it's software updates from the car end. It's software updates from the software end. Um, so it's, it's multi-pronged attack, I guess. All right, thanks, Nathan. And thanks for the question. Um, so, uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Um, they want to hurl at Nathan. Um, while people are thinking, I, I know we, we had the, the luxury of meeting in person last week. Um, and so I know that you talked about, uh, deploying these charger, these modular systems for drainage trucks and, uh, as well as like yard trucks. Um, so is that like, is that a market that you've kind of fallen into or where you're hoping to, to be, or is there a market that you're hoping to break into in the next year, five, 10 years or something like that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, I don't know if this would be a good description or not, but probably more of a market we fell into. I mean, there was just a need, um, you know, what you find a lot of in the, the fleets or the drage trucks is. Uh, you see a lot of people like trucks as a service or charging as a service. So they're basically uh, providing charging equipment, um, trucks, you know, everything required to electrify your fleet for either a monthly fee or a um, you know, kilowatt hour fleet fee. So you know, I think our product really makes sense for that, that clientele. Um, you know, we're definitely working in the public uh, sector as well. Um, you know, it's just, that's went a little slower than the fleet behind the fence um, just because I believe everybody is waiting for federal funding. They're waiting for Navi. They're waiting for the CFI discretionary funding. Um, you know, they're waiting for all those rather than investing uh, in this market currently. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that, that picture that you see on the display there. That's actually a Freightliner e Cascadia uh, pulling that system in, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, your client, uh, hooked up to it with an electric truck and pulled it into uh, their facility. It's very cool. It's important to to keep those whole ecosystems going. Um, uh, to use your own uh, kit, Nathan. I was wondering with those small with the smaller units. Um, what is the minimum um, like a trailer that would be needed to move maybe a few smaller units rather than. Um, you know, something that would be the four units, like what is shown on the screen. Do you have any uh, minimum um, specifications for the load for something like those uh, um, uh, single cabinet uh, modular yeah. that got into fleets early? So, some of that would be very helpful for school buses and dray truck operators. Uh, wondering about the um, trailer size. Yeah, so actually, Alan, I mean, the... I think I showed there in the beginning, we had maybe some tritium chargers, maybe an Altel. Those platforms are probably weighing in at, at 1,000, 1,200 pounds, just depends on the charger. Um, you know, we've actually moved them around in the back of a half ton pickup truck. So it's just a matter of having, um, you know, a fork truck on site to lift it. Um, but I mean, the, the weight on those is minimal. Now, when you get to the unit I showed that had the uh, 208 to 480, that has a transformer on it. Uh, we've hauled that in the back of a three quarter ton pickup truck, but it weighs a little more. The weight of the transformer is a bit heavier, but the single units and we build those anywhere between, 
I'm building one right now with a 240 kilowatt uh, DC fast charger on it. Um, but, you know, we build DC fast chargers on single platforms from 30, 40 kW up to 240 kW. Um, the limitation gets to be the actual power cord itself. Uh, when you start talking 180 kilowatt plus, you know, the weight per foot for the cable that's required for that ampacity is about seven pounds per foot. So if you give them a 20 foot extension cord, it's going to weigh, you know, the cord itself is going to weigh 150 pounds. Um, so a yeah, little bit of limitation when you get into higher amperage chargers, but um, definitely, you know, most people, if you've got a pickup truck, you can move these. Uh, I'm going to get my credit card. <laughs> How many do you want, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny you say that we actually have a few of these, some that look similar that we uh, that we got from uh, another partner in Maryland that we brought to our little warehouse here that we're trying to repurpose. Um, we have another question that came in um, and uh, Chad was asking is, Nathan, are you, as you grow, are you looking for uh, more CMs to help build your products? As far as site construction, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we try to partner up with, um, you know, local folks as much as we can. I'm a firm believer in, uh, using local labor as much as possible. Um, we're just trying to make it easier on them, um, you know, to to put in a good product, make the customer happy. You know, in some cases, you know, we can sell it to them and they can make some money on it too. Um, you know, a lot of the headaches are taken away. So, uh, yeah, reach out to me. Um, my email is there on the bottom. Uh, I'd be interested in talking. I'll also share his contact information and mine as well at the end. Yep. Uh, we're getting here close to, um, we had one other question come in is, are you doing any solar battery or storage builds? Um, and, and Jeffrey follows up with, I really think that EV adoption will not progress until the chargers are installed like fuel pumps. Um, what do you guys, what do you think about that, Nathan? Yeah. One of the slides I showed there showed the concept of it, you know, basically the energy storage, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of interest in it. Um, you know, I think that folks are going to have to understand demand charges a little more, uh, to really understand, you know, what that can help them do, you know, off peak, uh, you know, basically refilling the energy storage, uh, you know, kind of shifting your demand load to off peak times, you know, in West Virginia, if you look at a Nevi station, uh, you know, currently with a 600 kilowatt load you're going to have upwards of $125,000 a year in just demand charges. And it gets a lot worse in some other uh, places. So, I mean, I agree with you, energy storage, PV, you know, especially energy storage with kind of shifting that load a little bit um, is going to be huge. But, you know, we have clients that are definitely interested. I think there's some uh, areas, you know, it seems like out West, um, you know, a lot of the CPOs are, uh, pretty much saying, hey, it's got to have a canopy on it. Why not be PV? Um, so uh, it's it's great for our solution because it just integrates right in. I mean, we're able to use that same structural raceway, uh, integrate it back to our switchboards and you know, give them a nice, clean integration in the battery energy storage as well. Thank you for that, Nathan. Yeah, I've seen quite a few of... Um, like microgrids or uh, B to G and, and pushing for solar or photovoltaic off, off top of a charger. Um, that, that, and I saw your drawing for that. It looked very, very cool. Um, have you made those yet? I saw it said patent pending. Is that something you're still in production for? Yeah, we're still, you know, evaluating. Uh, you know, th there's a lot changing in the the battery market right now. I think there's a lot of players that are coming out with stuff that, especially for this application, you know, weight really doesn't become a, um, you know, problem. Um, you know, cost is coming down dramatically. I think that'll be a big, um, you know, catalyst to this is be able to buy, uh, you know, cheaper battery systems. You know, in West Virginia, they announced Form Energy. Um, you know, I believe that's a iron air chemistry, but, uh, you know, the potential for, substantially lower cost energy storage systems is really going to, uh, you know, help the charging, um, you know, CPOs, um, you know, fleet clients, that kind of stuff throughout the country.
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that comment, Jacob. I appreciate it. Um, well, we're coming up on an hour here, so I'm going to uh, share Nathan and I's contact as well as his website. Um, you can see that his email and his website are on the screen, but I've just shared if you want to copy and paste it for um, for later use. Um, we'll also upload uh, this video to YouTube if anyone wants to come back and reference it later. Um, feel free to contact myself or Nathan directly um, if you're interested in these systems and or EV charging in general. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or comments? Only, only nice comments, though, just to be clear. <laughs> Nathan, is there anything else you'd like to add before we uh, close out for the afternoon? Yeah, I mean, just thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, VCC. I mean, you you guys are really engaged. Uh, I feel as a stakeholder, um, you, know, you definitely are looking out for our best interest trying to get our product out there. And that's great. I mean, I appreciate that. Um, thanks for all the folks out there for listening in and uh, feel free to contact me. We'd love to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Of course. Yeah. And if anyone interested is like being a part of VCC and being a stakeholder and being a partner with us, please contact me, Matt Wade or Alan Harnett, Bruce Filk, quite a few of us here on this call. Um, Thanks again, Nathan. I appreciate it. And um, everyone have a good afternoon. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for tuning in today to the Technology Happy Hour. If you want to know more about Nathan and DC America and how you may be able to get your hand on some of those chargers, please send him an email. Uh, if you want to know more about Virginia Clean Cities, becoming a stakeholder, or being a featured guest, please contact me, Gregory Brennan, at Virginia Clean Cities. Or follow the links below in the description of this video. Our technology happy hours will be taking a break for the holidays, but come January, we'll be back hosting a happy hour every other month. So make sure you go to our website and sign up for our email updates and notifications so you don't miss the next one. And lastly, but most certainly not least, a special thanks to Nathan and the entire DC America team for what they do and being a stakeholder for Virginia Clean Cities. Until next time, take it easy.